daughter and, and the husband and family there. We're grateful to have the Alberts family with us today. Thank you for that song. John chapter 8, while the young people are dismissed, kids can be dismissed at this time. And we're going to go to John chapter 8. It's a number of years ago when my <clears throat> two oldest daughters were still pretty little. I was at home on a Saturday afternoon and I decided I would get a nap and while I was taking a nap my daughters were going to surprise me and they decided that they were going to wash my car and it was a not wasn't a super fancy car but it had a, it was a decent nice car and uh, so they were going to clean it all up for me it was dirty it was dusty and uh, so they go to the sink and they find some soap and they go under the sink, and they find a box of SOS pads. And uh, so there they go with their buckets of soapy water out to the car and uh, scrubbed away. Thankfully, they weren't so tall. Uh, only the bottom half of my car uh, lost its shine. And uh, so they were so excited when they woke me up, so happy to present their finished work. And uh, what do you do? I mean, you can't yell at them. They were just uh, just thrilled to be able to surprise me. I tell you that story for two reasons. Uh, don't take naps when you have kids at home. Okay? It's a big, big lesson I learned. When you've got a loaded kid around, don't take a nap. Okay. Secondly, we're not allowing them to work at the car wash on Saturday. So I wanted to tell you that uh, so you know that you're safe to come and uh, we'll take good care of your car. I, mean, I think it would be a blessing if you come for that. Uh, we're in John chapter 8. Aren't you glad we have the Word of God today? It's a blessing to be able to take from that and uh, learn from what the Bible has to say. We, uh, grandmother moved in with the family and uh, that still had small children. And uh, the two sisters were watching her one day. She constantly would read her Bible. And one of the girls asked her sister, why do you think Grandma reads her Bible so much? And, and the sister answered, I think she's studying for her finals. Uh, we all need to study for those, Amen especially as we get up there. John chapter 8, uh, and we're going to read a, a, verse, a few verses here in a minute. We, we just went through the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, uh, went through all nine fruits. We split it up into three different uh, messages, as you uh, remember, and, and talking about how to instill those in our life because they're all about growing. And if we want to uh, track our growth in the Christian life, we use those nine fruits as the marks on the door to see how much we have grown spiritually. And so as we have finished that, I was kind of looking and praying about what the Lord would have me do next. And I thought it would be good to observe the instances of the fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit in Jesus' life. And so today we're going to do that. We're going to look at the gentleness of Jesus. We're not going to go to any particular order, but uh, I want to look at the gentleness uh, of Jesus in, in a scene that we have from Scripture that is a tremendous blessing to me every time I read it. When we see how Jesus treated the Mary Magdalene's of the Bible, the lepers, the down and outs, the sinners and the publicans and those that society wanted nothing to do with and even called as one of his own disciples a tax collector that nobody had any, any love for at all. When you see how Jesus treated those people, you, when you see how he reacts to broken people, we clearly see his gentleness. There's a verse in Matthew chapter 12, verse 20, where it's quoting Isaiah. When Isaiah said, A bruised reed, talking about Christ, A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment into victory. A reed is a, uh, it really is a, a, a hollow cylinder. If it's bruised, the reed can no longer stand straight. It is, uh, uh, it, it's not strong. It never was really strong in the first place. Uh, but a bruised reed is weakness upon weakness. It is easy to break. It's a beautiful picture of how the broken people that Jesus comforted and healed throughout his ministry. 
smoking flax represents something that has lost its usefulness. It was the wick that you would have in lamps and and, uh, it would burn as long as the oil was there, but when the, uh, when it started to smolder, it would, uh, you've maybe experienced this, uh, it would cause those fumes that would burn your eyes. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders were like smoking flax in their teachings, but Jesus was patient even with them. Think of Nicodemus as an example of that. Jesus Christ combines compassion and justice so perfectly, the world has never seen its light. He is absolutely balanced. He's both righteous and just, and he is compassionate and gentle all at the same time. Uh, in these, in within him, these traits don't fight one another. In fact, they unite in him to make the perfect balance. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. It means, and the verse ends there, he'll bring forth judgment into victory, and he will bring forth judgment into victory. He will win over evil one day. But in the meantime, uh, he is so tender that a bruised and broken heart that's barely holding on, that's just about ready to go out, his, in his hands it won't be harmed. It'll be healed. This principle is illustrated in a beautiful way with the woman that we're going to read about in our text today. Starting at verse number 1 of chapter number 8 of John, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and set her in the midst. They said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they had continued asking him, he lifted himself up, uh, lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, or let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. When they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are these thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I want to preach today on the gentleness of Jesus. Father, I pray you'd help us in this, uh, not only in this message, but as we look forward and, and see all the times in Jesus' ministry where he had the fruit of the Spirit and displayed them so perfectly. I pray that we would continue to endeavor to instill these traits in our life. I pray you'd speak to us in a special way today. In Jesus' name, amen. We see here how he deals gently with her. It represents how he deals gently with us, and it behooves us that we deal gently with one another. Uh, It shows us how we should treat one another. I want to look at what this passage has to teach us, though, because as you unpack it, there's really quite a lot here that we can take and learn from this morning. Uh, We see the as the scene opens here, Jesus is sitting there, and he's teaching a group of people. It doesn't say how large a group of people, but presumably there was a small crowd of people there. And all of a sudden, they hear a commotion off to the side. There's a group of people hustling toward them to where Jesus is. And clearly there's one person in that group that does not want to come along uh, over to where Jesus is at. The others were dragging and shoving and forcing her to go along with them. What an awful, cruel thing that these religious leaders did. They came here dragging a woman, clothes in disarray, hair disheveled, drenched in shame. The Pharisees bring her right in the middle of all these people and publicly accuse her of basically harlotry or adultery. Uh, You can imagine the humiliation that uh, was in her heart and over her as this public accusation and exposure of her sin. Now, we're told twice in verses 3 and 4 here that we read that she was taken in adultery. Taken, the original word for taken, literally means to detect or to catch. 
So twice it basically said she was caught in adultery. And the Bible says in the very act. Now according to Jewish law, and this is important, she could not have been charged unless there were at least two eyewitnesses. So she was literally caught in the act. They had her dead to rights. Now Jesus is not being asked whether or not she is guilty. That's been established. He's being asked according to what her penalty would be. These folks here came to point out Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10, Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 22, how that uh, both of those verses say that anyone who commits adultery shall not only be put to death, but the Bible says surely be put to death. Now Mosaic law said that adultery is punishable by execution. Now verse 6 makes it very clear that they brought this up to trap Jesus. And they did a great job. I love throughout the New Testament when they tried to trick Jesus. Have you ever noticed those uh, scenes? There, they always. I love. I'll read them. I'll reread them. I think it's just awesome how Jesus always turned over their schemes and just hit them over the face with it when he uh, when they tried to trip him up. But here they got a good one. They got a really good trap here. And let me explain uh, why they did. Uh, on one side, you had the divine law of Moses, and on the other side, you had this woman who was caught in adultery. You see, Jesus preached and lived compassion, grace, forgiveness, and gentleness. He said that the kingdom of heaven is entered by the grace of God and by the forgiveness of God. This is how he taught. On the other hand, he said even on the Sermon on the Mount that the law of Moses was from God. He said in Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, and one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So here they are. They think we have finally got him. Because he will have no answer to our question. If he says, well, she was caught, put her to death. Then they can go and tell all the people, behold, you're Messiah. Uh, he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. He says, come unto me and I'll give you rest. Well, here's someone come unto him and he executed her. Some Messiah you have. Peace and love and forgiveness. Ha! Ah, he's just killing her. However, if he says, no, no, we can't punish her. We, she has to be forgiven. Then they can say, aha! He says he's from God. He says the law of Moses is from God. He's obviously not from God because he wouldn't have this contradiction. There's actually more. If he says to execute her for adultery, then he violates Roman law, who at that time had taken the right away from the Jews to officially execute people for religious offenses. That's why they had to take Jesus to the Roman officials. So they've got him. From every direction, they've got Jesus in a trap. He, is not a, he will have no wiggle room. I am sure there was a board meeting. I think they got together. I think they discussed just how they would do it, just how they would ask, so that all the times that Jesus has wiggled out from under him before, this time they've got him dead to rights. There is no answer for what they're giving him. And by the way, there's good reason for this. They didn't have an answer to it. Nobody has ever... People and religions all throughout the world have always tried to answer this, but no philosopher or religion has ever been able to solve this conundrum. Because if you have compassion, you trivialize morality. But if you have absolute morality, you crush people because we can't measure up to that morality. And aside from the gospel, friends, there is no answer to the human condition. You might try, oh, and many religions do, many philosophies do, but apart from the gospel, there's no answer for it. So, they were excited, they were eager, as they dragged this poor hapless woman to Jesus. Their plan uh, may <clears throat> have succeeded with an ordinary man, but they were dealing with Jesus Christ. And he simply refused to play by their rules. When they tried to stump Jesus, they discovered they met their match. Jesus does two things here, and in those two things lie pretty much the scope of ministry. Whether it's uh, somebody in ministry or the ministry that a church does. And so I want to point them out today. Number one, he disturbs the comfortable. Secondly, he comforts the disturbed. There you have it. That's pretty much ministry right there in a nutshell. 
you help the ones who have those needs and the ones who are a little too comfortable, you got to shake it up a little bit once in a while, okay? And uh, I want to look at how Jesus disturbs the comfortable to start with. First thing he did, as we read this, I, we're going we're gonna to, de- in detail, examine this text because that's how we learn the lessons from it. But the first thing Jesus did is he ignores them. Ooh, this is tough, by the way. Especially when you're important and you want attention, to be ignored is a hard thing. While they were talking, Jesus, I mean, while they're talking, they're, they're uh, bringing him this case and he's supposed to be oohed and awed by their presence. And while they're talking, he leans down on the ground, probably on one knee, and he starts to write in the dust of the ground. Uh, this is the only record we have of him writing anything in his entire life. He who has more books written about him than any other human being that has ever existed, yet he has never written anything except on a temple floor. What did he write? Well, for 2,000 years, men have been trying to solve that little mystery. And I can tell you today, I don't know. Nor does anybody know what Jesus wrote on the ground. But I have an opinion as to why he did what he did. I believe the reason Jesus wrote on the ground was simply for this very important reason. He did not have a cell phone. I'm going to explain that. I'm being serious. I think that's why he wrote on the ground. He didn't have a cell phone. If you want to be rude, impolite, offensive, and insulting, while somebody is talking to you, pick up a cell phone and start typing. Who, Who along with me loves that? You're having a conversation with somebody... And they just pick up their phone and start looking at it or texting somebody. Rude. That is, there, there is no clearer way to tell somebody, uh, I find you boring, uninteresting. I'd rather be anywhere than talking to you. And so the best that I can do is pick up my phone and electronically go somewhere else that you are not. That's essentially what you're saying by that. Well, Jesus didn't have a cell phone. So he texts on the ground. This is what he's trying to show them. This is what he's trying to show them. You don't matter, men, to them. He is trying to show them the insignificance of what they are. So I don't think it's really as important what he wrote. The Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. I really think a a lot of the message is in that he wrote. Because how rude is this? Think about it. How how noble is it that they come up and they've got this official request. They bring in a case to him, to the judge, and he just sits down and starts dilly-dallying on the ground texting while they're talking. This is a clear yawn in their direction. You think this is important? I'm not, I'm not biting. Now, there's another conclusion, and in this little detail here, I love these uh, things that you look, can pull from the Bible. There's others too, but you see the veracity, the reliability of the Bible in this. Let me read you a quote by <coughs> one historian. I am wholly convinced that the Gospels are not simply legends, Look at the story with Jesus scribbling in the dust with a woman caught in adultery. Nothing comes from the scribbling. It adds nothing to the story. The art of inventing little irrelevant details to make an imaginary scene more convincing, that's a purely modern practice. They didn't do those in ancient times where they add those pointless details. Surely the only explanation of this passage is the thing really happened. The author put it there simply because he'd seen it. So one reason that do we see in the Bible that Jesus wrote in the dirt is because Jesus wrote in the dirt. It, 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 the, 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 uh, the fact is there because the writer saw it. John. And not only did Jesus ignore them, he exposed them. So when he did speak, here's, here's how it went down. You see it, uh, it, it's very careful to show us Jesus' body language. So he gets down, they're talking, they're bringing this case to him. He gets down on his knee and he starts writing on the ground. And uh, they continue to talk. Look at the Bible says here. Uh, when they continued asking him, so again, visualizing Scripture, he's, they bring it here. Aha, we got him. We're going to throw this, this test at him. Jesus, we caught her in adultery. <sighs> he starts writing. Jesus, did you hear us? We caught this woman in adultery. What should we do? The Bible says we need to kill her. What do you think we should do? Nothing. Writing. He's making uh, emojis. 
you can't teach, you can't tell he did something else. I'm just going to pick emojis. So he's doing frowny emojis at this time because these guys showed up. So he's doing these frowny emojis and, and uh, he's just writing. And they continued to ask him. They continued. And so finally, he stands up. He's, oh, okay. Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. This is an incredibly loaded statement. I'm going to break it down for you because this is loaded with meaning. Uh, he gets up, and it's very important that he never says a stone shouldn't be thrown. That's important. In fact, because remember, they're looking to trap him. So he is not going against the law of Moses. He is not saying she shouldn't be stoned. In fact, he says, throw a stone. But I want the one who throws the stone to be without sin. He never denies there needs to be punishment. He does not even forbid capital punishment for sin. Now we know that uh, in the New Testament, capital punishment uh, for adultery is abolished. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, well, all throughout 1 Corinthians and see how Paul deals with this in the New Testament. I think 5 is uh, one of the chapters he deals with it. Uh, but here Jesus says nothing about the punishment or the severity of it. Instead, instead what he does is he essentially disqualifies those guys from either being the witnesses or the executioners in this little mock trial they had built up. We're going to see why. This is, this is brilliant on Jesus' part. By the way, by the time we get done with this today, I think you're going to agree with me. I'm just in awe of how Jesus handled this situation. Very, very, very interesting because it, it gets better. We're going to step back and get just a little context here. How was this woman caught in adultery? Because it says she was caught in the very act. Uh, Jewish law recognizes that capital punishment is an easily abused penalty. Think about it. Uh, look at countries today that practice chopping off heads and, and capital punishment at a whim. And it's abused in great ways. That's why in America, it's very hard for those that get the death penalty. There's all kinds of appeals process. It's a lengthy, timely thing. You don't just uh, get get uh, judged and you don't just get the death penalty and a week later you're in the gas chamber in the chair. That doesn't happen. There's a lengthy process, a lot that goes through because we recognize as a country that the uh, capital punishment is very, very serious. So did the Jewish law. And so Jewish law made it purposely very difficult to give someone the death penalty. For someone to be convicted of a capital offense, there had to be at least two witnesses. And not only did they have to see uh, the offense, but they had to be able to withstand all kinds of cross-examination about what happened. There's an old Jewish story of a woman named Susanna. Uh, a woman, she was innocent, but she was accused of two witnesses uh, of adultery, by two witnesses of adultery under a tree. This was in the time of Daniel, and the, the, the legend is that Daniel judged between them. But uh, she was acquitted because in the cross-examination, the witnesses couldn't come up with an agreement on the type of tree she was under. Uh, they had cooked up the story, but they didn't actually go into the detail. So to be, uh, to, to get, to, to, for capital punishment, to, to fall here, you had to have very reliable witnesses. You had to have two of them, and their story had to be spot on. The Mishnah, which is Jewish commentary, says that a court that executed more than one woman in seven years was a slaughterhouse. So this is not something that happened often. For this woman to be caught in adultery, to receive the death penalty, she had to be set up. I believe with all my heart, this was entrapment. And we, we have further proof of that, because where is the man? Where's the man in this? She, if they caught her in, in adultery, there's a man involved too, a man, or it wouldn't be adultery. Okay, So where is he at? And there, the, the, the wit, there's a little more before we get to that. There's one more thing I want to uh, tell you because this is part of the story too. The witnesses, in this case the entrappers, were to be first to cast stones. In, Dan in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. And afterwards, the hands of all the people. So when Jesus says, he that is without sin, let him first cast a stone, he's basically calling out the witnesses. Saying, the ones who are first to stone him have to be those witnesses. And he pricks them with guilt 
causing them to realize that he knew they were just as guilty as this woman was. So essentially, they knew that Jesus knew that they knew they were guilty of sin. They, he, that's his, he's as much telling in them that. Because if the two witnesses had actually caught her in adultery the way they said they did, and they probably did, they must have seen the man. Where's the man? Leviticus 20 verse 10 says, The adulterer and the adulteress shall both surely be put to death. Jesus is in a backward way calling their bluff here. He's not denying the law of Moses, and he's not denying compassion. He's just calling their bluff, making them squirm. They just had to be squirming as he's talking here. The fact that they dragged this woman in front of him, and they said, we saw her do it, but the man's not there, virtually proves their entrapment. In fact, I, my opinion is probably the man was there. He was probably one of them to help set it up. And probably Jesus was looking him dead in the eye when he said, he is without sin, cast the first stone. My, that's conjecture, the Yoder translation, okay. But uh, the man who was missing probably uh, was in the middle of him. So after Jesus does that, the first stone chuckers, the witnesses, would be incriminating themselves if they threw stones. You see what I'm saying? Jesus put them in a trap. So they tried to trap him. Now he's turning this trap around. Now if they do throw a rock, they're saying, they're basically admitting we're the witnesses, but we're not being honest because, of course, the man's not here. So we're trying to entrap her and we're admitting it by throwing a stone. Tell me Jesus didn't have them figured out. So Jesus turns to them. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. What's he saying? That only a sinless person can pun ever punish someone? Not at all. Jesus wasn't requiring that a that any judge be sinless. In that case, no human would ever be able to render judgment in any matter, even a court of law. Rather, he's saying, I know you, and I know the law of Moses that you appeal to, and you're breaking it, just like she did. Without saying a word, he's calling them a bunch of hypocrites. It's a stroke of genius how he dealt with them. And now they have nothing more to say. So here he goes, back to the visual. He stands up just long enough to say that, and in that statement is everything that we just talked about. They know it. He knows it. It's all inferred. They realize what's going on. Now they know that he knows that they know that he knows that they know what he knows. Okay? They, have, they, they get the picture. So all, that's all he says, says that to them, and then he gets back down and goes back to texting. Okay? Like they don't matter. He is not in one bit worried about these jokers. He just goes back to writing on the ground. Well, everything's silent, as you can imagine. If the crowd is still there, this would be fascinating to watch. Everything's quiet. All you can hear is the thunk, the rock, and the shuffle of sandals as one person walks out. The thunk of another rock. Somebody else walks away. And soon, there's no sound at all as they've all left. When the last rock, now we get to where Jesus then comforts the disturbed. The last rock hit, hit the temple floor. Jesus stood up and faced this woman. By the way, he is the only one qualified in this whole mix to actually throw a rock. He's the one that had the right to stone her, if he so desired. When she faced Jesus, she was facing the ultimate judge. She's reached a place in her life where it's just her and Jesus, and can I tell you, friend, every one of us are going to face that moment at some point. We don't know exactly when, but one day it will be only you and Jesus. You cannot blame your mate, your children, your parents, or your co-workers, or anybody else. It'll just be you and Jesus. She, uh, As she's standing there in front of him, I love, love the question he has, asks her here. Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? The other day, as I uh, often I'll read the text and I'll just kind of close my eyes and go through the visual. And I actually had a snort laugh. You ever had a snort laugh where you, something strikes you funny? When I read that, I had a little bit of a snort laugh because here's what I pictured. Jesus is right. He says what he says to the men and he's writing down here and they, of course, all <coughs> leave and he gets up. Where'd everybody go? 
That's kind of how I read that. I don't know why. I think that's hilarious. Uh, that they just all walked away and he says, Hey, woman, where are your accusers? What happened to him? Where'd everybody go? Uh, notice here also Jesus calls her woman. He only uses this term two other times in the Gospel of John. Once in chapter 2, once in chapter 19. Both of them he is reverently referring to his mother. Uh, he basically, it's a title of honor. It would be equivalent to a term today, lady or ma'am. And this woman, by the way, was anything but a woman of honor. But Jesus has a way of seeing things, friends, that isn't there at the time, but what can be. Amen. And in other words, he did not see this woman as she was. He saw what she could become through him. Jesus took a wicked, godless, carnal person and turned her into a lady. And when Jesus looks today at a lost sinner, He does not only see that sinner in his sin, He sees the potential of what that person could be. He sees that in your life as well. What a blessing. It's an awesome truth. When God looks at you, He does not see all the ways that you've messed up or failed Him. He does not hold a grudge against you. Rather, He sees what you can be, and then He'll help you get there. What a blessing that is. Friend, life doesn't have to remain the way that it is for you today. It can be better. It can be renewed if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then those beautiful words, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Again, that's another phrase that's loaded with truth. We're going to break it up real quickly here. Uh, We see a beautiful balance in here of holiness and compassion. I love the fact, by the way, Jesus did not for a minute let her resort to a victim mentality. Was she misused, abused? Yes, absolutely. He did not let her be a victim. And I like this. We live in a society today of victims. Oh my goodness. Everything is somebody else's fault. Everything is not... I'm absolved of everything because of how I was raised or the situation I'm in. Or We always blame something or somebody. Jesus never allows that. And so here, He did not let her be a victim. Uh, He says to her, I don't condemn you, but I hold you accountable. Go and sin no more. In other words, Jesus demanded conversion. He demanded a change of heart, a change of life. You see the balance here? Jesus did not say, you're not guilty. He said, I don't condemn you. He said, go and sin no more. That's the essence of the Gospel. You're guilty, but I don't condemn you. How could He say that? Now, is He talking about the legal case against her? He's just destroyed that because he sent all the witnesses packing. He won that court case. Her uh, legal court case towards capital punishment is gone. Poof, in the wind. That's done. So is that what he's talking about? I don't think for a minute that's what he's talking about. How can he say you're guilty, but I don't condemn you? Paul answers that question in Romans 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation in them that are in Christ Jesus. It is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary that God can justify you and take your condemnation away. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Do you understand today that Jesus Christ took your condemnation? He took your punishment. You are guilty, friend, and I'm guilty, but we're not condemned. Hallelujah. That's a blessing, isn't it? We're not condemned for our guilt. We deserve judgment, but all that condemnation, all that penalty is gone when Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee to this poor woman. He knows full well what this is going to cost Him. He could have said to her, I don't condemn you because I will be condemned for you. There will be rocks thrown, but they will be thrown at me. There will be spears thrown, but they are going to pierce my side Thorns will be pressed down, but they'll be pressed down on my brow. And because of that I can say, neither do I condemn thee. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Behold the balance. That this is sin, and this is wrong, and it deserves condemnation. But I don't condemn you. Why? Because I took your condemnation for you. Whew, what a blessing. Now there's an application very simple. Then if you're a bruised person, go to Him. Are you broken? Have you come to the end of your rope? Do you not know where to turn? He wants you to come to Him. Matthew 11, 28, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. What does it mean to go to Him? First, you stop your blame shifting. As long as we are blaming anybody but ourselves, then we are resorting in that victim mentality. 
He will have none of that. And so you come to Him, and then next you see Him on the cross where He is broken and bleeding, and that way, in the only way that He can say to you, neither do I condemn you, then say to Him like she says, Lord, recognizing who He is, what He has done, accepting His payment for your sin on your behalf, then His grace can come into your life and do what you cannot. A bruised reed shall He not break till He send forth judgment unto victory. (coughs) What a time to go down the wrong pipe. (coughs) My oh my though, don't you think (coughs) she felt the victory bells in her life at this time? Oof. What a blessing. You've got to give me a second. I don't know what you do with a lung full of water. Anyway. <clears throat> the second lesson, when, Christ, when God's grace comes, God's challenge comes along with it to obedience and growth. He does not say, neither do I condemn thee, and just leave it there. This is important. Stay with me on this one because we have American churches all over that do exactly that today. That's one of the problems with some of the churches in our town. And you know who I'm talking about that put flags out and any lifestyle is welcome here. You live how you want to live and you can come and feel welcome at our church. They make a big deal of accepting people as they are, no matter the lifestyle. Are you a man married to a man? Come to our church. Neither do we condemn thee. That's not real Christ-like love. Now, it's true that we at Bible Baptist Church Agree with that statement in principle. Come as you are. We will accept anybody that wants to come. And if you're a man married to a man, come to Bible Baptist Church. But we also do not believe that you come as you are and stay as you were. You come as you are and you leave change. Let the Bible and the Word of God change that sin in your life. Uh, Do you have a vicious temper? Do you beat up your wife and your kids? Come to Bible Baptist Church. But when you come, we don't expect you to stay that way. We hope that God will change your heart and your life. That's what the purpose is. So it's not enough to say, neither do I condemn thee. You have to add the go and sin no more. It's real grace that intercepts self-destructive behavior. Real grace, real love says, I have to get into this person's life and stop that person from destroying him or herself. This is exactly what Jesus did here. Too many American churches only use the first part of that line, neither do I condemn thee. But Jesus did not stop there. He said, go and sin no more. This is an integral part of the gospel, is a changed life. He does not expect us to stay the way that we always are. Yes, He will accept you where you are. Yes, the ground is level at the cross. Yes, God loves everyone and wants to save anyone. But He does not accept our sin. He expects there to be a change, just like He did with this lady. Real grace brings you in freely, and then it challenges you to grow. Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the way, it's the only trans I support. If you want to be trans, be that trans right there. Be transformed uh, (laughs) by the renewing of your mind. If you quote me, quote the whole quote, okay? I don't want you to take parts and bits. I know how people do those kind of things. Uh, Jesus' grace will always be attached to a challenge to growth and obedience. Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Can I encourage you today, friend, get off the treadmill of self-effort. Get off the treadmill of trying to make yourself worthy in God's eyes or others. He has taken your condemnation for you. You're not condemned, or you don't have to be. Trust in His works, not in your own works. Get Christ's no condemnation stamp of approval, and then accept His work on your behalf. That is then and only then can you get rid of the sin in your life and leave it behind. Then you'll grow, and that's the order coming to Him and using His power to transform our hearts and lives. That's the heart of Christianity. Come to Him and understand that He is waiting for you. We see in this story the gentleness of our Savior. What a blessing. He was 
in a backward way, he was pretty harsh with the guys that tried to trap him. But oh, he was so loving and gentle with this poor, destroyed by sin soul in front of him. Loved her. And he called her out on her sin, like he should have, but he loved her back to where she should be. Oh, the gentleness of our Savior. Maybe you, like this woman, have a life that has been wrecked and ruined by sin. Maybe you've been hurt uh, by religious people, or maybe you've been looking for a compassionate Savior, one who will make everything right. I invite you today, friend, if you have never come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, come to Him today. He can change all of that. He can take care of your condemnation. I talk to people all the time who have that condemnation heavy on their shoulders. They know they're sinners and and in some way we all understand at the core of our being that we're going to have to pay for our sin. What a blessing it is to hear He paid it all. He paid it all. There is now no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus. He wants to deliver you from your bondage. He wants to set you free. Therefore, He invites him, you to come to Him today. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we have the pianist come. Maybe you're in here today, friend, and I'm not going to embarrass, not going to point you out, nobody's looking around, but I would like to pray for you. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I don't know for sure that if something happened to me today, I hope, but I don't know that I'd be in heaven. I'm just not quite sure. In this area, would you slip up your hand? Let me pray for you. I won't embarrass your point out. I just want to pray for you. Is that you? Slip up your hand if that's you. Thank you so much. What about you, dear Christian? What What have you? Uh, <clears throat> we We go through our life all the time, and sometimes we understand that salvation is by grace, but then we think that we've still got to earn God's approval. We feel that weight of condemnation. Can I encourage you today to come to a gentle Savior? As she begins to play, would you stand along with me, heads bowed, eyes?